from Chicago's Can TV. A look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again, welcome to the show. And this the first 2013 edition of Chicago Newsroom and a happy new year to you. If you were one of those people that 2012 treated kind of roughly, may 13 be a much better year for you. And if you did okay, then you know, hope the good, good luck streak carries on. Anyway, one of the things that will definitely change this year is the way we administer health care in the United States. Obamacare will grow teeth in 2013 and several really important provisions are about to kick in. Uh, at least it appears they are. So we thought it would be a great way to begin our new year on Chicago Newsroom to have a consult and call in Dr. David Shiner for that consult. For about 40 years or more, David Shiner has been in private practice in Hyde Park, and for even longer than that, he's been passionate as an advocate for patients' rights and the distribution of quality health care on a universal basis universal basis. Did you catch that? So for a whole bunch of years, he's also been my physician too. Uh, and uh, I always look forward to my regular checkups because when uh, he's not rushing to the next appointment, we get to sit in the exam room and talk for a few minutes about national and local politics. And we usually solve all the problems of the world too. In fact, this show might even have some of its roots right there in that exam room. But anyway, Dr. Shiner attained a certain degree of national prominence in the last couple of years because of his 20 year stint as Barack Obama's doctor. So he and the future president probably had a couple of political discussions of their own in those little examining rooms down on 52nd Street. And I'm so happy, Dr. David Shiner, to welcome you finally to our show. Thank you, you finally much. made it here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I, th there are a lot of political and medical issues that have kind of come together over the last couple of years since Obama's been president. And uh, I mean, I, I think we've seen it all now come to a kind of culmination where uh, this year, like it or not, Obamacare is the law of the land. The Supreme Court has said it's the law of the land and it's about to get implemented. And that could be the part where it gets really interesting, right? How do you implement a monster like this? Well, you know, in terms of implementation, uh, the full Im implementation doesn't actually go into effect until 2014, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, there will be the mandatory health insurance. So right now, the pattern uh, of 50,000 Americans, approximately 50,000 Americans dying every year from lack of health insurance continued. In fact, from the time the bill was passed uh, in the Congress until the time that it goes into effect in 2014, over 200,000 Americans will have died from a th lack of health insurance. That was one of the things I had against the bill. It should have gone into effect immediately, mm -hmm. uh, flawed though it is. Uh, but there will be uh, at least 17 or 18 million more people on commercial insurance and uh, possibly 15 million more people uh, on Medicaid. Uh, there'll only be, only be 22 million people left without any health insurance, only in the richest country in the world. Uh, so, uh, some improvements have already begun. Uh, the issue of uh, uh, young people up to age 26 being able to use their parents' insurance, uh, that's been a good thing. Uh, the donut hole for paying, uh, Medicare paying prescriptions, that's beginning to close. Um, uh, there, I think there's some other, uh, there's some other programs too, which I can't recall in the, at the moment, mm -hmm. but that are beginning to go into effect. Now, you, of course, gained some national prominence going on television and being critical of your former patient uh, for not, not going all the way to universal health care. Um, I guess that's part of what you're talking about with the 20 million people who still will be uh, un, uninsured or underinsured or whatever it is. That's part of it. Uh, part of it is also the fact that uh, under uh, the law, uh, the private health insurance companies continue to uh, to be the major player. Uh, the administrative costs of health insurance are estimated to be about $400 billion a year. Now, one of the questions which hasn't really been answered is what is the purpose of the health care uh, mm -hmm. industry? Mm -hmm. Is it to provide care cheaply, efficiently, and effectively, or is it to drive the economy and provide jobs? Mm -hmm. For example, the $400 billion in health insurance administrative costs, which is a waste, no question it's a waste, but it employs a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Is that reason enough? It's like a WPA project. Is that enough to keep the thing going? Mm -hmm. No, it isn't, because that money could be used in other areas. We'd have to readjust the economy. Jobs would be lost. But $400 billion in insurance companies, the CEOs of these insurance companies, and I was on a program a couple of months ago talking about a man who, head of Aetna, made $20 million a year, 375 times more per year than I do. In <laughs> You're three not days, jealous, though. No, well, a little jealous. <laughs> I could use the money more effectively. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure but you they're could. wasting huge amounts of money. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, which uh, to get the law passed, Obama uh, made sort of a deal with the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. So they gave concessions of eighty billion dollars over a ten-year period, mm -hmm. which is eight billion dollars per year. Mm -hmm. Lipitor alone, when it was uh, uh, its own drug before it became generic. Uh, was making $11 billion a year. So that was bupkis. Mm -hmm. That was absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. Uh, now, finally, as a part of this negotiation that they're talking about and trying to cut costs of Medicare, they are talking about uh, competitive bidding for drugs. The VA system, which is an excellent health system, albeit socialized, uh, <laughs> uh, the VA system, uh, they competitively bid for drugs so that they can get the cheapest drug. Uh, I don't know if Congress will allow it or if the pharmaceutical industry will fight them uh, on this issue, but it could save billions and billions of dollars. So uh, would you say at this point that we're at least, that this is a decent start and that, that, it, that it allows for uh, incremental improvements as years go by or, or are you just really disgusted with the thing? You know, I, I guess my feeling is something is better than nothing, and there will be people covered uh, who would probably have died without this bill having uh, law having been passed. Uh, the, the incredible thing is that we're, we're reinventing the wheel. This mm -hmm. has already been done mm -hmm. all over the Western world. Mm -hmm. The United States right now is 37th in the world in healthcare statistics. I mean, the systems have already been developed. Why can't we look at some of these other ones? People think, well, uh, my I, son lives in London. He, he gets incredible health care <laughs> and uh, socialized medicine. People that, don't even know what socialized medicine that is. That got you country. thrown off Fox Business, didn't it, for mentioning the 37? Uh, yeah, Lou Dobbs uh, threw Lou me Dobbs, off. Yeah, that yeah. was one of my proudest moments. Lou Dobbs moments. was not happy with you. Oh, I, I, I kept that. repeating, 37th yeah. in the world. Yeah. We'll let you keep going on this show, though. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> You're very liberal. <laughs> So it, it, the bill has some things in it which I like, but I think you know the, the, the waste, the cost controls are not very effective in the thing. Uh, the electronic medical record, which is now being mandated. Now I'm a luddite, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm perhaps a bad one to talk about these things. But one of the effects, unintended consequences of the electronic medical record, is the cost is prohibitive. Uh, Thirty to forty thousand dollars has been estimated per physician. Now, and that doesn't count, th that's to start it up, it doesn't count the lost business when you have to cut your practice uh, significantly until you can get up to speed, so to speak. Uh, so the cost is extra extraordinary. Uh, but, the but benefits you're not, you're, are you're, not well known. It's gonna dis it is destroying private practices. If you look in, uh, in the health... Electronic in medical records are, are helping destroying private because practice? Because physicians can no longer afford to be independent practitioners. They're now selling out to hospitals all over the country. What's that got to do with electronic medical records? Because of the cost. The cost of electronic medical records is prohibitive. Not only is it uh, the cost high, there are mandates that the government insists upon uh, various offices uh, f uh, following. And to follow those mandates, you have, a, have to have a lot of uh, personnel that can enter that data so that you cannot survive anymore in private practice. And that's what's happening. Private practice is disappearing. So I'm, I'm confused because you, you, you seem to be coming at these things from the left, but your arguments sound very much like uh, uh, John Boehner. I mean, uh, what you're, you're arguing for the for the private practice for private entrepreneurship, and that private entrepreneurship is being limited by this big government. Well, I, the thing is, the question is, it's the private practice of medicine in the small office versus being owned by corporations, health corporations, and uh, hospital corporations. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. for example, 
the North Northwestern, I think the CEO of Northwestern, a not-for-profit institution, makes about $10 million a year, a CEO of a non-profit hospital. Now, that's not exactly what I want running the whole health system. Are there problems with individual private practice? No question there are problems. But I'm not sure the corporatization of medicine is an improvement. Could we have gone different? Well, if we could we have gone different? If we had universal Medicare, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. Mm. I mean, uh, that is obviously the answer. Because then you could be a private practitioner and you'd have to compete in Absolute, the marketplace and for. Having an, uh, you know, uh, Medicare, universal Medicare does, is that isn't socialized medicine. Mm -hmm. The congressman, they don't even know what socialized medicine is. Under uh, universal Medicare, the pharmaceutical companies are still private, the hospitals are still private, uh, nursing aides, everything's still private. It's just that the, uh, the payer is the, is the federal government. And it, it would save tremendous amounts of money. How can you make that statement when everyone who ever seems to look at this agrees that, that as soon as you give a whole bunch of money to the government, then the costs go through the roof? Well, first of all, we have the health expenditures per capita in this country are twice as high as the nearest competing, uh, competing uh, government in the, in the Western world. Mm -hmm. So our costs are twice as high. So I don't believe that for a second. Uh, Medicare's uh, overhead is about three to four percent, as opposed to private health insurance, which is between 17 and 22 percent. Mm -hmm. So that, that's nonsense. Now, I, I, in your practice, do you see Medicare patients? I'd say about 80 percent of my patients are Medicare. Oh. Oh, okay, so, yes. so you have some experience with Medicare. <laughs> I'd say so. Uh, and would, would you say that, uh, that the, the commonly made argument that doctors are getting squeezed and that they're, they, don't even make, they, don't, the, they don't even make the cost of seeing that patient because the, the government is constantly cutting back on Medicare and squeezing the doctors, do you agree with that? Well, Medicare's more or less remained about the same. Of course, every year they have this threat of the cut, uh, and if they don't do some legislative maneuvering, uh, it'll be cut about 25% uh, mm -hmm. in January. Uh, you know, I make an adequate living. I'm, I'm not that, I, you know, I, but I, I mean, mean, how much, how soft does your bed have to be? Could Medicare pay better? Yeah, and I think they could pay better to primary care. What offends me is the amount of money being made by subspecialists as opposed to primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. Primary care physicians are the ones who are being squeezed to, to pieces. That's what you are. And I am a primary care physician. The per, uh, percentage of medical students going into primary care is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Because now, it's hard work, long hours, and not much pay. You got it. And in the, within the academic institution, low prestige also. We've mm -hmm. also been uh, always at the bottom of the totem pole. Mm -hmm. uh, when this new health uh, law is fully We're talking today on Chicago Newsroom with a low prestige physician, Dr. <laughs> David Shiner, who is, I, I, don't, I don't think of you when I think of low prestige, but yeah. uh, maybe that's what, that's what your profession is becoming. I was kicked off the staff at the University of Chicago because they said they didn't want outside doctors, and uh, so I figured they didn't appreciate me. Um, <laughs> one of the problems when the law goes into effect, uh, we're going to have maybe 35 million more people who are going to have to see primary care physicians. Uh -huh. Where are the primary care physicians right, going right. to come from? They're going to, I've said this before, they're going to have to go to Walgreens mm -hmm. to get their uh, primary care. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's unacceptable. Another thing that's happening, which people are not aware of, is that much of the care of the poor in inner city is delivered by physicians who are international medical graduates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A squeeze is being put onto international medical graduates because as we increase the number of domestic students uh, coming out of the co this country, there's not going to be enough residency spots for international graduates. And they disproportionately take care of the poor and inner city populations. That's, that's interesting. It, it doesn't, doesn't it seem a little bit counterintuitive, though, that, that there is going, that the medical care universe is going to be expanded. There's going to be more money flowing through the system. How can it be that there is going to be, that, that there's going to be a shortage of doctors? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it seem like people would, would be att attracted to this, this business and, and that the business is expanding and this would be a good place for, for young people to want to build a career? Well, they are doing that. And you know, certainly there's great demand for uh, medical students. Uh, uh, 
slots in the medical schools. Uh, but but they're all saying, going into the subspecialties. Uh -huh. I mean, how many you know, subspecialists do you need? We have an incredible number of subspecialists. And they can't give primary care. Well, give me an example. Uh, well, one of the things that most What's a worthless subspecialty? <laughs> well, you know, I can't say they're worthless subspecialties, but I don't think, I'm not, I resent the fact that a dermatology resident, uh, first year out of training, makes twice as much as I've ever made in my life. I don't think they have as many life and death decisions as I have to make, and the stress that I have to make, and the 3 a.m. phone calls that I get. I think we should be paid to a certain extent on, based on the amount of uh, time and stress in our, and uh, why thinking is, I mean, we have to do. Why is that? Is it because the, the marketplace is deciding that it needs more dermatologists? Than marketplace is, uh, call it the AMA has a committee that decides, we get paid by what they call relative value units. That's how much uh, sort of credit you get for seeing patients. And they- uh, Relative value, value units. units. Right, and the committee that makes this up, I think there's about 20, 25 members. Most of them are subspecialists. So the relative value units given to the subspecialists tend to be greater than those given by the primary care doctors. Uh, but in, in the real world, what that means, as I, as I understand it, because you've, you've railed at me on this uh, in the past uh, while I've been waiting for my physical exam. <laughs> Truly. I do so rail. I've heard this I do from rail. Before. <laughs> I've heard you from this before. But I mean essentially what I think what I've taken from this is that there really is a need for that guy like you are to me and to many other people the the sort of the the the, the guy of first defense the person you call when you're sick, right? And and so this is this is a very valuable piece of the medical infrastructure but it's less attractive to, to be one of these people today than it might have been 20 or 30 years ago. You know, when they- And that, that is, I mean, that, that we're, we're joking a little bit, but that's a really serious They did a study about it. this. Uh, I saw one of the Annals of Internal Medicine, I think it was. And the three big factors, one was uh, income, why you don't go into primary care. Two was lifestyle. Mm -hmm you know, being at the uh, beck and call of the telephone. Mm -hmm. And three, interesting enough, was an unwillingness to deal with old people because they have problems mm -hmm. that don't go away. Yeah, you have to keep yeah. seeing so the same problem hero. over and over. One mm -hmm. of the things that's happened today is the hospitalist movement. Now, the hospitalist movement is an interesting phenomenon, and I think it's sort of dehumanizing medicine. These are people that get out of, just out of residency, and they become hospitalists. They're employed by the hospital, they're there full time. Uh, they c came into being when the HMOs were prominent because th with the hospitalist, they were there when the test was ordered at eight o'clock in the morning, done at eight o'clock in the morning, they'd see the results at 10, then they could order more tests, and at 12, they'd see those results so they could get the patient out faster. Mm -hmm. They do get the patient out faster, but the at the expense of a tremendous increase in the amount of testing that's done. Mm -hmm. Also, some studies have shown that after they get out of the hospital, the costs seem to be even greater because these people don't really have a knowledge of uh, how patients take care of themselves when they're outside of the hospital. Uh, hospitals so also really are often given it. bonuses for getting patients out faster. Okay, yeah, yeah. Now, a patient is most vulnerable when they're sick and in the hospital, no question. Yeah. That's yeah. when you really are vulnerable. So your doctor, let's say my patients who have seen me for 35 years, they go into the hospital. I no longer go into the hospital. They see a perfect stranger who's who is taking care of them. Do I communicate with the hospitalist? A smidgen, mm -hmm. not that much. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're seeing a stranger. At some places, at nighttime, they have somebody else called a nocturnalist who takes the rounds. So during a hospital stay, they might have three or four different people who are responsible mm -hmm. for their care. And yet this person has had, a, has a 30 year relationship with a primary care physician. And that's not, who's no, it's no longer part of the it's gone. equation. It's not yeah. part of the equation. Yeah. My patients are terribly upset. Pa when you, you inter used an interesting word about uh, defense or something, I feel sometimes that my role is to defend people from the hospital system and from the emergency room system. Emergency, we haven't even talked about emergency rooms, but that's another area. Well, Mitt Romney said that's, that's a good place to get your primary no. care. Uh, 
it is a good place to go to if you've got a bullet in your chest, a knife sticking out of your back, you're hemorrhaging massively. But if you have a medical problem, it may be one of the worst places to go. They don't know how to evaluate because they're not trained that way. I, but they're being forced to handle all of this stuff. I mean, they're being in, forced in to the, handle because that's what patients right. where, where they expect to get their care. Sometimes right. the simplest problems, they are in, incapable of treating properly in emergency rooms. Now they're not all bad. Not every decision to make is bad, but I see enough that worries me tremendously. And the cost of the procedures in the emergency room is just, it's humongous. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. if you talk to emergency room physicians, they'll say, we don't want to get sued. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a real issue. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of my well, contact. That, that actually, that's another hour long show right well, there. You know, the, in terms I of my contact with Obama, I never really talked to anything political. The only thing we ever discussed that had any political import was the question of tort reform. And he was, as a lawyer, he was ultimately opposed to it. Mm -hmm. Now. Do I think it's a, the major factor? No. It is a factor, and as long as it's there, doctors will use it as an excuse. Mm -hmm. But if you had to ask me, what do I think the main reason for all these unnecessary tests are? I think it's physician ignorance, physician unwillingness to touch patients, mm -hmm. physician unwilling to examine patients, physician unwillingness to listen to patients. Ask patients how much time the doctor spends actually listening to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's frightening. Doctors don't know how to do physical exams anymore. I mean, I, I see this all the time. I mean, I won't recall. Yeah, and, and is that, is that just? Uh, is that just a? Uh, are you just saying that for effect, or do you really, you really believe that that no, doctors don't know how to do physical exams? Why? Well, They're not trained. I'm not saying all doctors. Well. I think they don't want to spend the time. They've got that CT they can order, the MRI they can order, the blood test they can order, the angiogram they can order. And they also they, have 40 patients to see in one day or something so like that. So it's much that. faster, it's much faster doing that. Mm -hmm. It's much faster. That may be part of the thing too. But sometimes uh, there is a particular blood test that they order. And if it's positive, uh, they order uh, a CAT scan of the chest. Well, uh, the blood test they're ordering, they don't understand the meaning of it. The test is only meaningful if it's negative. If it's positive, it doesn't mean anything because there's 80% false positives they don't understand the concept. I've talked to them about it, and they refuse to say, yes, but. And they, they, this kind of thing goes on and on. Now, just because you have good health insurance also, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you're good, good that health you're care. You're gonna get good health care. The care. best care. example, I know a man in, uh, about in his late 40s, early, not quite 50, went for a general checkup. As a, just, a healthy person, general checkup, received after his diagnostic test, the equivalent of 135 chest x-rays in radiation. Who was that person? The President of the United States. And that isn't private knowledge, that's public knowledge. He received that amount of radiation. He had a CAT scan of his heart, which is not an approved procedure as a routine screening. And he had virtual colonoscopy, which is also not really the way to go. But a the, lot the, of radiation, and that's lifetime yeah. radiation, one out of and people getting CAT scans, the incidence is about one out of 2,000 end up eventually, 20 years later, getting cancer. But you know, that, it's very interesting that you bring that up because that is kind of indicative of something that we can sort of look down the telescope the other way. Here is arguably the most prominent and important man on the planet and the medical professionals, uh, the last thing in the world they want is this guy getting sick or dying on their watch, right? So they have to do everything they have to use every tool at their disposal to make sure that if that guy gets a pimple, they know about it, right? Bring that down three or four, five, six, eight, ten levels to where us ordinary mortals are, and isn't that really kind of, isn't that part of the motivation of, of the medical profession today is to say, we want to, we want to be as aggressive as we can at trying to figure out as early as we can when something's wrong with you. And the best way to do that is using these new tools that we have at our disposal. We have amazing diagnostic tools that, that you didn't have when you started. Well, you know, it was just, I remember some years ago, uh, Oprah Winfrey was uh, arguing for people getting total body uh, CAT scans. Sometimes you're gonna find something. You know, every once in a while you're gonna find something. That still doesn't justify it. The cost is too much. Mm -hmm. And you have to think about cost. Cost in, 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 in not cost only dollars, but in cost to your body. In, exactly. The diagnostic tests are not without risk. Mm -hmm. You have to use, you know, we talk about evidence-based medicine and then we ignore it. Evidence-based medicine, if it doesn't work, you don't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett had his cancer of the prostate uh, treated with radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. If he'd been my patient, he wouldn't have known he had prostate cancer. I wouldn't have checked it in an 80-year-old. 80% mm -hmm. of men 80 years old have prostate cancer. They die mm -hmm. with it, not of it. Of it. Jerry Brown, the governor of California, is now being treated for prostate cancer, 74. Mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. I'm 74. I've stopped getting my PSAs. Mm -hmm. The man who developed the PSA, which is to detect prostate cancer, wrote an op-ed piece three years ago in the Times in which he regretted having ever discovered that test because mm -hmm. he thinks it caused more mischief. Mm -hmm. We've got to use evidence. We can't do every test on every person to pick up that rare, uh, rare situation when you pick up the cancer or something. You may cure an occasional person, but the cost is too much. You've so, got to have some interest of society. So what would you do to, uh, to, to encourage more people to come into the general practice? Well, the only way, it's a difficult thing, because you know, the money thing is, is part of it, mm -hmm. and you've got to find a way, but the lifestyle is a different thing. I, but how you, how do you inculcate I, dedication? But are you, are you not know. saying that younger people don't want to have the lifestyle that you've had, that they're, that they're, they're just not interested in, in being devoted to their job all the time? I mean, there are plenty of young people who are like that. There are people. There are young people in the world of politics. I saw them in City Hall. They work for Rahm Emanuel. They work 19, 20, 3, 20 hours a day. So there are. It's not. It's not a generational thing. Uh, I'm not sure that's that's the case or not. Huh? Now, being an old curmudgeon, uh, you always think your generation was better. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people don't talk. You know, when you ask people why they're going to medicine, I never hear. You know, in the old days, we would say it. Maybe people thought it was it was phony. We want to save lives. We want to do things for humanity. But people at least thought they should say that kind of thing. Now they don't even bother saying that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think. I don't think uh, people want to do that. Now I made. I had a problem. I, you know, the kind of life I didn't see my children grow up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would never change what I did. I have. You know, if I die tomorrow, I feel I've done something right. Uh, my patients love me, and I love them. They're part of my family. Right. When my wife died, my first wife died. Uh, they, they comforted me. They yeah, gave me yeah, food. They invited yeah. me into their homes. Yeah. My patients, I am s close to them. I treat sometimes three generations. This is an incredible thing. I don't know how you make people understand it, what an incredible thing that is. I make house calls, and it's fantastic. I saw a woman last week. I went to visit her. Just She was dying, and I wanted to say goodbye to her, and she died three days later, but I, I was able to say goodbye to her, and the family was around. It was an incredible feeling. Mm. And I mean, and there, you know, I'd like to have more money, but that's, but that's an incredible that feeling. Times. Well, money, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, Sophie Tucker once said, I've been rich and I've been poor, being rich is better. <laughs> yeah, right. um, money is important, but it's, but it's not the whole thing. And the pleasure that I get, the uh, excitement when I get involved in those kinds of emotional situations is incredible. But do people want that today? I don't know. And that's where we're gonna leave it. That question will hang in the air. David Shiner, thank you so much for being with us today. Dr. David Shiner is uh, a, a physician and a medical activist and happens to be my doctor too. And I just thought I should share him with you. You ought to see him because he's a pretty cool guy. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service at Can TV. Of course, you know you can see us here all the time and you can watch us right on this, uh, this thing right here. And we're happy to be with you again for another whole year. Hope you'll watch us for another 52 weeks. We'll see you next time right here on Chicago Newsroom. Thanks, bye.